This is the Mark O. Hatfield Federal Courthouse in downtown Portland. When federal officers were sent to the progressive city, the 16-story building became a flashpoint. It was about five and a half weeks of continued violence against a federal courthouse there. The Rioting, Department of looting, arson, and violence we have seen in Democrat-run cities all. Agents from across the U.S. Department of Homeland Security were deputized to help protect the city's federal buildings from protesters. But the arrival of federal forces did little to quell protests. Hundreds of protesters, both longtime activists and first-timers, arrived nightly to demonstrate against racial injustice following the death of George Floyd in police custody. In mid-July on social media, Reports swirled about protesters being swept into unmarked vans by individuals wearing camouflage fatigues. How are we supposed to know who you are? Oh, that is the feds. What the f To gain insight into the Trump administration's response in Portland, the Washington Post conducted an in-depth examination of four instances when unsuspecting people were scooped up from the city streets by heavily armed federal agents in the middle of the night based on information that turned out to be inaccurate or insufficient to charge them with a crime. I'm Evelyn Bassey. Uh, I'm Mark Pettibone. Well, I'm John. Uh, my name is Tawasi. From detention to release, they described experiences they found harrowing and unnerving. Three are speaking for the first time. One was picked up and interrogated in an unmarked van, she said, and then dropped off in a different part of the city. Two others were held in jail cells before being let go without explanations or charges. Another, a U.S. citizen, was misidentified by federal agents as a foreigner and arrested on charges that were later dropped. Each of their encounters started with armed federal authorities rushing towards them in the dark. The video of Evelyn Bassey being taken into custody went viral but she did not disclose her identity publicly until now. Use your words, what are you doing? At 1.56 a.m. on July 15th, Bassey was standing with a friend in an empty intersection when an unmarked van with doors open on the passenger side pulled up in front of them. And I noticed that the back door was ajar and that the front door was ajar, and then I noticed that there were people in camo. I know I threw my hands up and said, we're leaving, we're leaving, like, we're not causing any trouble. <laughs> Bassie and her friend turned to run. The dark gray Dodge Caravan chased them for a half a block before making a U-turn for Bassie, who had doubled back toward the intersection. What are you doing? Two Use officers doing? with yellow police patches on the front of their vests. Use your words, what are you doing? And Customs and Border Patrol insignia on their arms approached Bassie. Use your words. They held her arms behind her back and escorted her to the van. NLG will get you out. What's your name? Tell us your name. They never said who they were. I didn't know if I was going to be seen again. I didn't know what was going on. But I could tell that I was being arrested or detained or something. Officers placed Bassie in the van, closed the doors, and drove off. Inside, Bassie said she was forced to sit on the floor of the van and wasn't told where she was going or why. So there were two people in the front seats. Uh, the driver and a passenger, and then the two in the back with me. There was no middle seat. They told me to put my hands on top of my head, on top of my helmet, just like this, and keep my head down and sit crisscross applesauce, basically. The officer who had his hands on my head asked me what my name was, and I said, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to remain silent. Then they asked if I had blonde hair, and I said no. Bassie was driven to a spot seven blocks away and they had me get out and put my hands on top of the car. My wits kicked back in and I started asking, uh, am I being detained? Yes, you're being detained. What am I being detained for? Uh, you're being detained for, uh, because he matched the description of somebody who committed a federal crime against an officer. I asked what crime was committed and that's when they said um, that somebody had shined a laser pointer into an officer's eyes. And then they had me turn my head to the side and just kind of all around rotate it. And that's when I noticed that they were holding a phone. And I later found out that they were comparing my face to a picture. But then eventually they said, okay, that's not him. 
This isn't the, the person. The officers let Bassey, who is transgender, go, but with a warning, she said. They again said, just so you know, bro, we have cameras everywhere. And then they just said, all right, you're free to go. Leave. Leave the area. And so I did. Bassey said she was held for roughly 10 minutes. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Oregon said it considers someone to be arrested if they are detained for any period of time. Under that definition, Bassey, along with other cases examined by the Post, would qualify as arrests. 30 minutes after Bassey was picked up, less than a mile away, protester Mark Pettibone and his friend Connor O'Shea were on their way home. We were stopped on 5th Avenue uh, by some protesters, and they warned us that they had seen unmarked vans kind of patrolling the perimeter. In fact, we, we thought we spotted one that would have been south a few blocks down. Uh, and as we were looking over there, one happened to pull up right by us. Four or five military fatigue clad people jumped out and um, I feared for my life. Pettibone ran down Southwest Main Street and turned onto Southwest Broadway Avenue. A van followed just seconds later. This is the last time Pettibone appears on security camera footage in the vicinity that night. It pulled up in front of me and people jumped out. So I got to my knees and kept my hands visible and asked why several times, to which they didn't respond. Um, and they uh, basically put me into the van. Pettibone's friend witnessed the arrest from a distance. He recorded this video message on his phone as a warning. Feds are driving around, grabbing people off the streets. They didn't do anything wrong. I'm recording this. Try to let somebody know that this is what happened. The vehicle that swept Pettibone up appeared to be the same make and model as the one that picked Bassie up. Pettibone said officers pulled his beanie over his eyes so he couldn't see. About three minutes after Pettibone's arrest, a dark gray van was seen behind the federal courthouse, headed in the direction of the building's garage door. Uh, the next time I could see was getting out of the van. I was able to maneuver the beanie back over my glasses um, with my arm as I was getting out. Um, and I was in a garage uh, and um, led to a wall where they proceeded to take my picture several times with a, an, a phone and we went up to another floor and got out. Pettibone said officers did not ask permission to search his backpack and they commented on what they found. I just remember a couple of comments was, um, this is a whole lot of nothing. Once they put me in the cell uh, and they came around to read me my rights, they didn't say why I was under arrest and I don't remember them saying you were under arrest. Pettibone said he was in the cell for roughly two hours when he was released without explanation. His possessions were returned to him in a trash bag. There was one, uh, I still have it, there was uh, kind of a, a sheet of paper, a lined sheet of paper that just said Pettibone, my last name, and cell number. But that was the only form of documentation that I got. The video of Bassi's arrest and Pettibone's public remarks about his arrest sparked national outrage. The Oregon Attorney General's office filed a lawsuit against the federal government, accusing federal officers of violating protesters' rights and Oregon sovereignty. It also sought an order restraining federal agents from making arrests without warrants and requiring them to identify themselves and the reason for any detention. A federal judge denied the request, ruling the state didn't have a strong enough interest to sue on behalf of protesters. On July 24th, far-left video blogger Tawasi, whose full legal name is Tawasi, had finished protesting for the night and was returning home around 2.30 a.m. Almost immediately after he made a right turn onto the street where he was staying, he was met by federal law enforcement officers in at least two vehicles. Even before I got there, the, the police uh, surrounded me. They came out in unmarked cars, approached with guns drawn, in, in plain clothes, but uh, with, with flak jackets on. They, they entered my car on both sides. When they entered my car, 
the officer actually said, we got you Mr. Hickey. And I had never heard of that person. So I told the officer, like, you definitely got me, but I am not Mr. Hickey. I, I have no idea who that is. My name's Tawasi. Tawasi said the officers identified themselves as Homeland Security Investigations agents. They questioned him about Canada and asked where he was from. Tawasi said they searched his car, seized his phone, and continued to misidentify him as Ronald Hickey, a Canadian national. Tawasi is an American citizen of Native American descent. So they, they pat me down um, and they tell me that I'm charged with this code violation um, for some code that I never heard of and also um, immigration violations for illegally crossing the border. Tawasi was handcuffed and placed in the rear passenger seat of a black vehicle by officers in riot gear. Like Pettibone, Tawasi was driven to the federal courthouse. Officers took him upstairs. You know, they're walking me through this, this jail complex, and as they do, they're telling me not to look. So they're saying, like, look at the wall, or don't look at me. Once upstairs, Tawasi said an agent took his fingerprints. He was then put into a holding cell. That feeling of being inside of a cell and not having any contact with anyone and not having a phone number to call for a lawyer, um, you know, that was probably my most terrified hour. In court for his initial appearance, Tuasi learned the charges against him stemmed from tweets he had sent under his own name, urging protesters to make noise in front of the Portland Hotel where he believed federal officers were staying. Prosecutors initially alleged these tweets violated a statute prohibiting the release of personal information about federal officers in an effort to threaten, intimidate, or incite violence against them. The charges were dropped just over two weeks later. The U.S. Attorney's Office for Oregon declined to comment to the Post about Tawasi's case or explain how it had misidentified so, him uh, as a Canadian national named Ronald Hickey. When they were releasing me, they uh, gave me an envelope and that envelope had in it a little bit of money and my car keys and um, did not have my phone. So I in the 32 hours after his arrest, Google tracking data that Tawasi had enabled on his phone indicated it went to a parking lot behind the federal courthouse, Portland State University, the Internal Revenue Service building, an unspecified location near the Portland Police Bureau Training Division, and a residential neighborhood about 10 miles south of Portland. Tawasi's phone has not yet been returned. Not long after 3.30 a.m. on July 29th, John Hacker, a self-described civilian journalist, was standing in front of the federal courthouse. He was speaking with Jake Johnson, another civilian journalist, when Hacker was targeted with a green laser. I think actually Jake noticed the light before I did. Green laser. Uh, like seriously, is this a joke? You not? He had looked up and was like shouting at the officers that were way up. Um, on I don't know what floor. Uh, this is uh, not, not great. The laser came from a seventh floor balcony of the federal courthouse, which federal agents used as a lookout. Dude, you have the wrong target. I don't know what the you want me to Two unmarked vehicles, a Honda Odyssey and Chevrolet Tahoe, drove up to the intersection. A Border Patrol officer, who appears to have exited from the right side of the dark gray Chevrolet, grabbed Hacker's left wrist. The officer said nothing to me. Hacker was walked over to the white Honda. An officer removed Hacker's phone from his right hand and placed it on top of the van, cuffed Hacker, and put him inside. Four Federal Protective Service vehicles arrived at the scene shortly after. Eight minutes after Hacker was marked with the green laser, he was driven to the other side of the courthouse, where he was searched, photographed, and jailed. They took multiple photos of me from the front with multiple phones that looked like personal cell phones. Um, they then turned me around and put a sticker on my right 
on, the, on my back, on my right shoulder, took another picture from behind. Um, at one point, one of the officers asked another if he was the arresting officer and he responded with, I'm not sure, I think so. They went through my pockets, had me take off my belt and shoes, asked for name, social security number, and birth date. Uh, I resisted a little bit with the social security number asking, or I told him I said I've never heard of law enforcement asking for a social security number and he said, you'll hear about it. Hacker was taken to a floor with holding cells. I would say somewhere around a half hour. They, when they came back in, they had asked for uh, fingerprints and a DNA swab, mouth swab. Um, so I told them I don't have prints um, because of amputations. Um, and then they took the mouth swab, um, which was a little bit weird to me. Hacker says federal law enforcement kept him in custody for an hour and a half. He was released with little explanation. At this point, I didn't know what was going on, and but then the, one of the officers said, are we transferring him? And the um, guy that was moving me through said, no, we're releasing him. So th at that point, I was like, okay, I'm being released. There was uh, probably like eight, to a dozen officers out in the garage. And one of them said, we're releasing you without charges. We've done an investigation, determined you've committed no crime and here's your property, have a nice day. And then I walked out. They did not give me my phone, uh, but I did not know that they kept my phone until I got out back to the park and was going through all my stuff and putting it in my pockets. Hacker's phone has still not been returned. None of the four is facing charges, and they all deny taking part in illegal activity. So it definitely has impacted my ability to document um, in a way that really shows what's going on because there's that constant fear around keeping, you know, extra distance. I know that my anxiety is very rampant to the point where there's times where, like even right now, my hand is shaking and I can't stop it. And it seemed, at least from uh, my personal experience, it seemed completely indiscriminate. Uh, it could have been anyone. Uh, it could have been someone walking to their apartment complex down the street. I have extra paranoia that I didn't have before because they came for me in the middle of the night in unmarked cars. So now when I'm driving somewhere, I don't just take it for granted that I'm going to be able to get home. I have tucked away in my mind somewhere that they could be watching me, waiting for me at the next corner.